the Workforce Connections podcast, where we discuss workforce development in Southern Nevada. Here's your host. Hi, and welcome to the WC Podcast. On today's episode, we have a special guest all the way from Ohio. I'm going to welcome my peer from uh, Central Ohio Workforce Development Board, Lisa Pat McDaniel, the CEO. Lisa, welcome. Thank you so much for having me here. It's awesome to see you here because, you know, usually we see each other in national meetings, whether we're at a NOB, National Association of Workforce Board meetings, or a U.S. Conference of Mayors Workforce Development Council meeting. Uh, but today you're here in Las Vegas, in our area. So, so, so happy to see you. I'm so happy to be here and see what you do. <laughs> so. so what do you... Um, you know, what do you think about our recording studio? I'm, I'm very impressed because uh, the podcast we do is usually on Zoom. We don't have a studio, and now I'm very jealous, <laughs> and I will probably take pictures and bring it on home and say, I think we need to do this. Good. So, Yeah, any information we can share with you, we'll be glad to. A, a year ago, one of our board members said, we need to do a podcast. We need to have a podcast, and of course... Uh, I said, you know, what is a podcast? Because I truly <laughs> did not know. I didn't listen or follow any. And But since then, I did some research, you know, followed, uh, subscribed to some, learned all we had to about mics and cameras and lights and things like that. Um, and here we are a year later, I think uh, over 100 episodes now. So. Wow. Okay, that is impressive. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. Um, but Lisa, Lisa, you're here because, you know, uh, it's not often that I have one of my peers here. As you know, there's 550 local boards, 550 plus local boards across the nation. Uh, but you and I uh, happen to be fortunate enough to be a part of a group that they call High Impact Boards. Uh, Ron Painter and the NOB organization convenes us. We also are fortunate to sit on, on the Workforce Development Council for the work, uh, mm -hmm. U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, for you, what does it mean to be called a High Impact Workforce Development Board? That's a great question. So uh, I think when I think about high impact, I think about several things. I think one is being a board that's proactive rather than always reactive. And I know with my board, uh, we've been giving a lot of thought to how can we use things like data, uh, performance, payment for performance, um, research, evidence-based research, and be more proactive so that um, we are there in time for job seekers who need assistance and to work with employers to be employers of choice and not uh, just always reactive um, and not giving job seekers the best information and opportunities to where they can go uh, to have a career pathway. And, uh, and also employers who are scrambling around for talent, but instead being magnets for that talent. And um, that is what we think about every day. And I know my board wants to be the thought leader in our region. So that's what I see as a high impact board. I would agree. I think that's why um, I love going to these meetings where I see you because I get to learn from my peers. Mm hmm from those and and we our regions look different from each other you know our economies look different but at the end of the day as you said we're trying to all of us connect employers to the workforce that they need and so for that we need you know partners in the higher education uh, but all of the post-secondary really skill acquisition system uh, you know apprenticeships vocational trainings community colleges but m even um just as important, the earliest piece of the workforce development pipeline, which is the K through 12 system, which a lot of times, you know, we call it the education system, but really we're preparing the workers of tomorrow. And so uh, one of our roles as a local board, as you know, is to convene this ecosystem. Uh, and, and even beyond the 17 mandated uh, partners from WIOA, again, the school districts and stuff. So how do we as boards tell us about how you're doing it in central Ohio and uh, maybe then even in general, since we learn from our peers, how can boards best fulfill that role of being the convener of the ecosystem? Well, we see the board as the backbone for the system, right? And so uh, the first thing we did uh, right after WIOA was passed and we were reorganized a little, and that's when I came on to the board staff, we convened our partners, our system partners, so that we called them system partners, but when we looked at each other, we really weren't a system. And uh, we decided 
we needed to map out what the system looked like and um, we needed to be able to show collective impact to employers and funders, right? Uh, so we started there. So we have our workforce, we call it the Workforce Advisory Council, only because they're a, an advisory council to the board, but it's all our system partners. Then we took a look and said, we've got to look at our young adults because in Ohio, maybe different than here, not sure, I'm sure you'll tell me, we aren't growing population-wise as fast as we would need to, and we're not projected to, but yet we have some very major projects that have been announced. And we thought, well, we, we've got to be working really hard with our young adults, and now uh, we're working to get funding to work in the high schools because, um, you know, in high school, they're about educating the workforce. You're absolutely right about that. But the system, the workforce system, we're the ones who every day know what our labor market looks like, where the opportunities are. Um, we have the best connections really with our employers compared to our schools. Mm -hmm. They try, but the, they try and they try, right? And then they're always complaining about each other just because they don't know how to engage. So we're that uh, neutral party in the middle who can um, provide that kind of coaching, that kind of information, uh, kind of make those marriages, if you will, between the talent that's emerging and the opportunities that are there with employers. And so I think it's really important because boards are that neutral party in the middle of both education and higher education and uh, career technical education and employers, to be able to share that kind of information in the middle and help a job seeker find out where's the best place for me to get this kind of credential or degree uh, and have employers say, where, where is the best place to this, get this kind of skilled talent? And that's, that's why I think we're the, really probably the best organization to be the convener in almost every labor market, I would say. I agree. I think our peers across the nation would agree. You mentioned something about the high schools and some of the things we hope to share with you during your visit here in Vegas uh, after this podcast is, you know, uh, how are we, what do our American job centers look like, right, in our community? Uh, we are now for a few years uh, trying out to go after this um, strategy of uh making the resources accessible closer to where people live and work. So in a lot of areas, urban areas, uh, mostly we build, uh, you know, brick and mortar buildings in the center of town. And then we ask everybody to travel mm -hmm. and sometimes get on a bus or two to reach us. And so for a few years now, we've been here. Uh, we've had an amazing partnership with our library districts. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as uh, rural towns two hours away, uh, we now have American job centers and libraries where they didn't exist before. And so we have uh, not just uh, libraries uh, that are embedded in neighborhoods and communities, but since then now we also have American job centers and community colleges, uh, chambers of commerce, uh, municipal city halls, uh, county uh, recreation centers, um, and most importantly, the latest one, I left this because you said uh, K through 12, uh, we most recently, we built a career technical academy here in Las Vegas for CTA education or career technical education. And it's a magnet site. And in it, it has a uh, family support center and also an American job center. So wow. as far as we know, uh, it's the only school in the nation that has a built-in American job center, which is great because in that school, there's a, a, an approach to try to serve the entire family, not just the students and connect mm -hmm. them to the labor market, but also their families. It's a low-income area, the, so the school doesn't close at 3 or 4. It stays open until night, so the families can also come and take advantage of the industry, uh, you know, um, equipment and programs that are there. So it's a really, really cool thing. But again, for us, it's been really meaningful to build partnerships with our school district, our community colleges, our chambers of commerce, uh, to be able to uh, really expand our reach uh, without costing the taxpayer more. All these locations that I mentioned to you that we're in now, uh, they we avoid or we don't pay any rent or janitorial security. And so 
uh, it's now over, uh, I think, close to $1.2 million that we have uh, avoid paying for facilities because, mm -hmm. we're uh, again, we've built these partnerships. And as you know, in our budgets, uh, an additional $1.2 million that you're not spending on something, you can spend on helping more people. So right, absolutely. <laughs> tell me, in, in Central Ohio, what kind of partnerships have you built uh, like the ones I shared here from Las Vegas? Well, I know I'm going to build more after hearing you talk. <laughs> so we started with the libraries because there is, we have a wonderful library system in central Ohio and there is a beautiful branch. They, they've done a lot of capital improvements in every neighborhood and most of our suburban partners. And then we have a few other libraries that are outside of that library system, but we've really partnered also with them. Um, instead of so we've, what we've done is we've moved coaches out there. We've brought, we have a um, jobs mobile nice. <laughs> that we have brought to help promote what we were doing. Um, but now we are buckling down and making it more formal. So we might have uh, our coaches um, make appointments and show up there, but we haven't necessarily branded that specifically in that library. And we're moving to do that. Then when I talked about our system partners, uh, we are starting to now be at those locations as well to provide services because it's the same. You're right. We've got this beautiful job center in the middle of town. And hopefully if, if you come to Columbus next June, you, you'll see it. Yes. Uh, we made good use of uh, a crisis. So when COVID hit, we renovated the whole job center. Wow. But um, we don't want everyone to have to come down there. And they can't all come down there. And we also need to expand our hours when we're available to people, right? Uh, because the number one problem I see us facing in Columbus with our labor is that um, many of many people, they're working and they're working hard and they're working two jobs, right? So they can't come to a job center between eight and five. And so we've got to be more available. The libraries provide us that opportunity, probably more even than our system partners because the libraries are open every day and most days until nine. And so that way we know we, we can be much more available uh, to people. And we have a smaller region, I think, than, than you have. Um, so those libraries are really in all of the key places. And it's easy for us to provide, to have our staff go out to those places. We've also partnered with our community college and um, they aren't very far from their primary branch, is not very far from where our job center is. But um, I, th I think, you know, there's pros and cons to that. But we're trying to uh, partner with them to work with students, especially our students who are first time college attending kids. And give them the same information we would give everybody else so they don't get into the community college and kind of flounder around and not really know what they want to do and then spend out their Pell and then leave, right? Mm -hmm. We want to uh, partner with them, give them the information, help with the community college career counseling so that they, they choose a path, connect them to those employers while they're in school. Um, so that's another big partnership that we've built out. And um, we have uh, also a network of partners that we fund in our high schools where we have the most need. So Columbus City Schools, um, I could tell you the other districts, they won't mean anything to the people who are watching this, but several of the districts within Franklin County uh, so that we're working with them while they're still in school, right? Making sure they finish school and have a plan and then help them to actualize that plan, whether it's going into post-secondary, going into apprenticeship, uh, or going into some kind of a short-term credential uh, and right into employment. So those are our primary partnerships. I love it. Yeah. I love yeah. it. So, um, Lisa, uh, what would help, I think, our listeners and our viewers is, you know, here at Workforce Connections has four counties. Clark is the big one, mm -hmm. and it's 95% of the population, about 2.1 million people here in Clark County. But then we also have three smaller counties uh, that are rural, Lincoln, Esmeralda, and Nye. Uh, and again, that's only represents 5% of, uh, of, our, of, our, of the people we serve. 
What does your region look like uh, where you are? How many counties and what's the population you serve? So we have one county, and it's the county that surrounds Columbus, essentially. Um, then the county surrounding us uh, to the northwest and kind of the uh, southwest belong to another board, and then we're bordered on the other side by another board. But what we've done, and there's political reasons for that, sure. which you, you know we don't need to get into, but uh, so we're, we're serving uh, upwards of one million plus. Okay. Uh, but you know, job seekers and employers don't recognize boundaries That's when right. they're looking for workforce or they're going to work. That's right. So uh, especially with the announcement of some major projects in Ohio, Intel, is one of the plants that just got announced. It's to the county to the east of us. And uh, Honda is building a battery plant uh, southwest of us, in the county southwest of us. The boards, the other two boards, we've realized, you know, we really need to be partnering heavily together. And so we've started to do that. Uh, we were doing it before, but now we're, we're formalizing that. Uh, because we want to have uh, no wrong door. The city of Columbus also goes outside of our county. That's another really interesting thing that can happen in Ohio. I don't know if it can happen here. So um, we really want to partner when people come to us or they come to one of our other the surrounding boards, we want to make sure that we're all providing them the same kinds of service, that we're seamlessly moving them to where they need to go. They don't have to know. Uh, who they're being served with, just that they're getting what they need. And That's we do right. that with our employers too. So we, we're a little bit smaller than you are, um, but I think we probably are facing some of the same, the same issues. And I would say that those counties surrounding us, you know, if you, <laughs> there's still parts of Columbus, especially if you're coming in from the south, that you could be standing in a cornfield but see downtown. Right. And so we're still in growth mode, in major growth mode. But those counties surrounding us are becoming more and more developed and more and more part of really the urban core. And that is something that's really been relatively new in the last 10 to 15 years. So that's why it's taken us a while to really formalize that partnership. But we want to do that before now while things are really popping all over uh, because we just see it continuing. Right. And, and I agree with you. I think despite our geographical differences, um, our, we as uh, executive directors of local boards face the same challenges everywhere. Um, my next question uh, has to do, you know, uh, with something now I think people are, uh, we've all become tired of talking about, but I don't think we'll ever finish talking about it because when we were growing up, uh, you know, we, we heard about this worldwide pandemic called, you know, the Spanish flu right. and it killed a lot of people, unfortunately. And, but who would have known that we also would now be able to say we live through a worldwide pandemic. And so, right. uh, but here we are. And so how did the pandemic affect your region and, and how, uh, what does it look like now, if you will, post pandemic? Cause COVID is here. It was still, we're probably going to stay here again, like the flu and everything else that, you know, that we have to learn to live with, but um, how did it affect your region? And, and, and what does it look like now post pandemic? That's a great question. And you're right. I, I never in a million years would have seen or predicted what happened. So it affect it definitely affected our region. It affected women uh, more than men, um, women of color more than white women. Um, so many women have stepped out of uh, the workforce. And right now, uh, we are concentrating a lot on helping those women get back. I think what it did, um, you know, there were problems, probably problems that are similar to here with lack of child care, um, you know, transportation issues. Uh, those were all here before the pandemic, but the pandemic ripped off the band-aids that we might have had on some of those problems. It also, you know, you have employers who are saying, well, now people aren't coming back to work or I can't find people. And we're saying to them, no, before the pandemic, this problem was coming at us. The pandemic just made it get here quicker. And it made it clearer to all of you who maybe weren't in it like you and I being workforce professionals, right? So 
I guess if you could say, I hate to say there's a positive side, there really isn't a positive side, right? But the positives that have come out of the pandemic is it's really turned those private sector leaders on to paying attention to the pro problems we were already facing. And they didn't feel that shortage of workers as much as they feel it now. And so now they're willing to listen. They're willing, we, in Columbus, Columbus is not a strong um, union area because it hasn't been a strong manufacturing area. And Cleveland and Cincinnati and Ohio uh, much have much more manufacturing than Columbus has had. So everybody in Columbus, in the private sector, they associate apprenticeship with the trades. And there's certainly a lot of construction in Columbus, but companies didn't really see apprenticeship as a solution, right? Well, now, because they are fighting for people, they don't know where the workers have gone, um, things like apprenticeship as a solution, they're much more open to it. They're much more paying attention to it. When we talk about women being uh, the most adversely affected by the pandemic mm -hmm. and the fact that child care, there's not enough child care, right? We had a lot of child care um, uh, centers close. There's just not enough of it. Um, we've talked a lot more about um, women wanting flexibility and women wanting to work for you as an employer, mm -hmm. uh, but willing to work during these hours. And then, you know, we have a large service economy, having um, set schedules, not changing people's schedules all the time, allowing for that flexibility, allowing women to work while kids are in school and knowing that they'll get their work, the rest of their work done after they pick up their kids from school. Um, there is a lot more openness to that. I think that's a good thing. Um, so, you know, I think as we, I mean, I talk about these things ad nauseum, really, in our market now. Yeah. But they're listening, and yep. they wouldn't listen before. Um, but there's still, uh, there's still a group who are afraid still sure. about coming back to work. Uh, our healthcare partners, we have four major hospital systems. And if you take, for example, the Ohio State, their medical center, the Wexner Medical Center, you know, when we had Intel come and Intel says, we're gonna create 3,000 jobs, the Wexner Medical Center is saying, I have 3,000 jobs open, open today. Yeah. You know, and that's just one of them. Yep. And um, we have other employers as well who are saying that. So, you know, on the negative side, uh, you know, it was a horrible thing to happen. We are, our, our labor participation rate is close to where it was, but we still have, you know, lots of people who haven't come back to work. On the positive side, I think it has really brought these issues to the forefront in a way that we just couldn't get traction on before the pandemic. So, I mean, if you're gonna have something horrible happen, make good use of a crisis, right? Yeah, I think it validates, um, it's the same here, as you said, yeah. uh, everything you said. So it's a very um, interesting to see that validated again across our country. As you can imagine here, there's one in construction right now called the Fountain Blue. But every time we open a casino resort here, it's six, eight, ten thousand 10,000 people we need to hire. Wow. And so in the past, it's never been a problem. Think about all the major casinos we have here in this area. But it, it is a problem now because... As you said, it's competing with the new hospital and the new school and all the other things that need employees. So uh, one of the things that we were talking about before uh, May, March of 2020, the pandemic, uh, I think, again, in our meetings that we, that we would go to was the future of work. You know, it was the hot topic before we knew what COVID was. And we were talking about what does the future of work look like? Uh, how does uh, how do the new technologies, right? The evolution mm -hmm. of technologies, uh, automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, how is that gonna shape the workforce? We were talking about how uh, a lot of people were gonna lose their jobs. And, you know, again, looking today, it says, wow, uh, this, um, this, these technologies uh, are, are something that could help us mitigate this labor shortage, right? <laughs> it's kind of flipped. Right. And, and also what we talked about then was, 
when is this coming? Is it five, 10 years from now? Many people say the pandemic accelerated the advent of the future of work. The future of work is now. And we see that here on the Strip. We see hotels now implementing virtual dealers. You know, we, ha we have robotic bartenders. We have uh, robots going in the elevators, delivering seats up to the floors. And so it, it really, we see it happening right here in our economy. How has this, uh, if at all, impacted your region's economy? Well, right before the pandemic, we had commissioned a report called The Future of Work, <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, we were doing some projections about uh, what jobs were going to be affected by automation, uh, where could we expect to have growth for real people. And, uh, and it's, so f it's funny and not funny, really, because we were going to do a big splash uh, introducing it, and then the pandemic hit. So we still have that report, though, and we're still using it, even if we didn't get the traction out of it. And on my way here, actually, uh, we were, uh, I was working on uh, our sector partnership that we're starting exactly in that, automation, robotics, and cybersecurity, because we know cybersecurity is really important if you're going to have robotics doing the work. So... Uh, we know in Columbus the same, actually the same thing. We've seen uh, automation, um, and automation is robotics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen it taking off probably more quickly. And I think, again, it goes back to, we were still going to have this issue without the pandemic. It's just made people see it so much quicker. We haven't had to do the education because it's happened, right? And so they've all had to move more quickly towards it. Um, so, you know, we have a strong uh, finance and insurance industry in Columbus. And uh, so we, we see artificial intelligence uh, taking over a lot of the kinds of jobs uh, that real people did in insurance and finance. Um, and now, as I said, we have advanced manufacturing, but it just wasn't concentrated in Franklin County. And that's no longer the case. So all of that advanced manufacturing involves robotics. And so um, that isn't a skill set that we have. I mean, we worked, we didn't work to build it. Our schools were starting to build it and it was a niche kind of area. Now, no, we've really got to look at how we wholesale build that skill set because we are gonna desperately need it for the companies that are now coming to Columbus, number one, but also the companies that are already there, because as you've said, with less people, a lot of that work has to be done. There's a lot of fear around it. Yes. People think they're going to, you know, there'll be less jobs for them. And I say, well, okay, right now, there are two jobs for every unemployed person, uh, two to three jobs, <laughs> in the Franklin County, in central Ohio, actually, is a market. And, um, you know, we try to explain, you know, the automation, first of all, someone has to run the robots. They don't just run by themselves. And the skill set that is needed for workers is just a higher level skill set. But then what that means is, right, as that education gap, we had an education gap, and we think it has gotten bigger. And where we were trying to figure out how do we close that gap before the pandemic, now it's bigger. And we have got to be not just the workforce system, but the private sector system and the education system. We really can't just say, oh, we're gonna solve this in little robotics clubs, right? right. We have to get a wholesale bigger in order to make sure we've got that skilled workforce. And so that's why we're forming a sector partnership to do exactly that, to really focus people uh, on, on how do we build that system? How do we build out those programs so that we have the skilled workforce for who's already here and who, who, you know, who's gonna come, right? I'd love to hear that uh, because we also, I know how much of a lift that is. Uh, forming an industry sector partnership and convening yeah. employers. Uh, we had not done that here in, Los, in, in Southern Nevada, uh, but we do have uh, now seven target industries that, we, that we're that we focusing on, and each one of them in 2022 has had a uh, industry sector partnership launched for it. So we have seven working ones now for our target industries, and like you, the employers are really uh, willing uh, to you know put skin in the game 
to solve these very complex issues that, that, that we've talked about today. What do you hope uh, to take away from this visit to Las Vegas? I know it's a mixture of, you know, you're, you're doing some personal stuff, but you're also obviously here doing business stuff. What is your hopes to take away from this trip professionally? Well, just from hearing you speak when we've been at things together, I know that there's some neat things going on here. I'm always looking for what are those best practices that you're doing and are they something we can bring back? I understand not everything everybody does everywhere can translate to other places, right? right? But there's always aspects of it that can. And um, so I was really excited to see what it is you're doing and seeing, you know, what aspects of those things can I bring back to Columbus and steal? And then when you come to Columbus, you know, and I say, look what we're doing and you can, well, maybe you could learn from us, but you'll say, oh, look what she's doing. I wonder where she learned that from. I think it was us. Yeah. No, and and again, that's what I love about our uh, friendships that we have with our peers at the U.S. Conference of Mayors Workforce Development Council, at the at the National Association of Workforce Boards High Impact, you know, Boards Group. Um, You are now uh, the second peer that's visited us. Uh, Tamara uh, Atkinson was here here, with, with her board chair from Austin. Uh, and we had a, a ball, and uh, and I think Tamara, if you're listening, uh, you know you probably have your podcast going already. She was inspired. She was going to go right She's back start her own. to Austin, start her own. <laughs> but then I would say to any of our our peers that are watching, uh, you know, because we're going to share this with them. Uh, Daniela, Nick, Pam, uh, Trin, if you're watching, you know, we want you here in Vegas on the podcast. So now Tamara and Lisa have been here. So um, uh, Lisa, again, uh, I want to thank you for being here at this moment. I'd like to turn back the mic on to you. Uh, You can share anything with us that you want our listeners to learn about. We'll put a website, a URL or a number here on the screen. Uh, Maybe even at the very least, how they can know more about the work you do. What is that website that they can go to? Great. It's a www www.wdbco so workforce development board of central ohio.org and uh, from there you can get to our ohio means job center that is our american job center and you can see the initiatives that we're doing and the partnerships that we're doing and uh, we would love to have anybody who's interested to see what we're doing come uh, to Columbus. My podcast isn't as fancy as yours, but it, it might be after this. Uh, <laughs> very good. Uh, yeah, I can't wait to come and visit you and be on your podcast. So thank you so much for stopping and being with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for entertaining me and uh, showing me what it is you all do here. And after this, we're going to go back to uh, and get to business and talk about all the things that you want to uh, learn about here or right. at least uh, get to know about. So. Great. Thank you. All right. This is uh, it for another episode of the WC Podcast. We hope to see you at the next one. Until then, stay safe. All right, Lisa, thank you for staying over to do our bonus segment called Against the Wall. Are you ready? I am ready. All right. The first portion is called Your Favorite. So I'm going to give you a category, and you're going to give me your favorite thing in that category. Okay. Your favorite food? Uh, Pasta. Favorite movie? Uh, Dirty Dancing. Favorite book? Oh, my gosh. My favorite book? Uh, Franklin, um, Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of... I can't even remember the name of it. <laughs> a lot of these successful people. Yeah, very good one. <laughs> Your favorite subject in school? History. Favorite artist or musical group? John Legend, who's here, and I'm not even going to get to see oh, him no. on here. <laughs> Your favorite holiday? Oh, gosh. Easter. And your favorite way to relax? My favorite way to relax? Reading a book by a pool. Very good. Well, you made it through our first portion with Flying Colors. The second one is called Tough Choices, where I'm going to give you, again, two choices. You're going to pick one. Are you ready? I am. Are you more of a vacation person or staycation? Vacation. Would you rather have more money or more time? Time. Would you rather retire in a big city or in a small town? Both. (laughs) I like it. (laughs) Would you rather owe money or owe a favor? 
I'd rather owe a favor. All right. Are you the person that likes to cook the meal or rather clean the kitchen? No, I like to cook the meal. <laughs> okay. Here's a, a tough one. Justice or grace? That is a tough one. I would say both. All right. My favorite, actions or words? Actions. You made it through the second portion. Sure. We're running the corner to the final segment here. It's called finish the sentence. So I'm going to give you 90% of the sentence. You're going to finish it for me. You ready? Sure. If Lisa could live anywhere, it would be? Italy. <laughs> Lisa's favorite thing about her job is? The people. The best part about visiting Las Vegas is? Being on your podcast. <laughs> I love it. If Lisa could travel back in time, she would travel to? The Renaissance period. Ooh, very nice. The one thing Lisa will never regret is? My career choices. Mm, love it. Three words that describe Lisa are? Enthusiastic, full of energy, and unafraid. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Very nicely said. And the final question, doing the WC podcast here today with us was? So much fun. <laughs> okay.